Kickstarter, my name is Rob McCallum, and I'm here with my next project that sees me delve back into the world of gaming, box art, a gaming documentary. Take a look at our teaser. Cover art and box art have gone hand in hand with products for hundreds of years. It's advertising, right? Well, what if there was more to it? What if a cover was more than a cover? What if the cover was actually integral to the product, as well as to the people in the process that created it? For video games, that's exactly the case. Examining the art of both console and PC games, as well as domestic and international variations, we'll show you the evolution of video game box art how the process has changed, and of course, discover the unsung heroes responsible for some of the most iconic images in video game history. The time has come to get the full picture on video game box art. Game on! Honestly, I, I realized I've been doing something wrong because what I need to find out is about you making a documentary about awesome hosts who do YouTube and other documentaries about, you know, talking to people. And I need to get in on that. That's what I need to do. So when is that documentary coming out? Well, if you, th if you think there's a market for it, probably <laughs> in about two months, we'll kickstart that and see what happens. Oh, a market. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> you always start with the audience and work backwards. <laughs> All right. So if you don't know this man, you need to. And most people already do, Robert Cullen. You've already seen, of course, Nintendo Quest and Power J Skull. That when I saw that, I mean, that idea was just awesome because I grew up watching He Man. The idea of that is awesome. And now Thanks. box art. I mean, that's right now on Kickstarter. You got to go fund that. Not only just get it funded, but get the extended, the stretch goals funded as well. Thanks for coming on, join us on Obsolete Gamer Show again. Yeah, thanks for having me, man, and for giving me such love for all those projects past, present, and uh, who knows, future maybe, YouTube host documentary. That would be interesting. Just I, I don't know about the... I think there are a few documentaries out there on uh, YouTube culture and uh, the rise of the YouTube star. Uh, oh, yeah. And I think it's a really fascinating idea, to be completely honest, in the way we which uh, we self-impose celebrity to a degree, but not in that negative way that the word celebrity is somehow taken on with uh, the TMZ generation that we've, we've become. I think it's great that we have the tools that are at our disposal to broadcast anything we want and we can you know, gain a following and people can tune into that. We're not limited to what other people push out there on our TV sets. Yeah, before we get into uh, this new Kickstarter that you're doing, you know, I was just sure. looking over like all the past work and I, and I noticed like on your IMDb page, like all the work that you do in art. Can you just tell me about you know, how you got into the industry, because people are always asking about that. You know, I'm in film school, and for me, my path is more writing. But a lot of people do different paths, cinematography. I know some people are design students, so people are always asking, how do I break in? How do I break in? So for you, like, especially with the art, and now you're doing a lot more, and of course, a lot of it is about expanding, wearing a lot of hats. Can you tell us about your experience? Sure. Um, well, like yourself, I'm a writer first and foremost, and... The short version is uh, writing is really cheap and easy to do. You need a pen and paper, and that's pretty uh, common, right? There's no excuse not to be able to write. Even if you just have your phone on you, you can write in you know, a notes application or something like that, and it's really easy to brainstorm. And I think everything that I do always comes back to writing, especially in documentaries when we get to the edit stage. It's really writing with pictures. So anybody that's looking to break into film or content creation as, as a broader idea, I say definitely learn how to write, learn story structure, learn classic myths, um, and start from there. I, you know, went to university. I got a BA in film theory. Then I did uh, postgraduate work in, in production. I did I have two postgraduate degrees, uh, one in directing and producing and one in editing and design. Uh, and it just uh, it started from there. I never said no when I was offered a chance to work on a, a project, whether it was paid or deferred or whatever. I just wanted to get experience. And then I, at a certain point, I just wanted to start doing my stuff. I was doing the old balancing act between I started a company and I was going to do corporate video so I could take the money I earned from that and do my own projects. And it's a slippery slope for some people because it's hard to turn down good money. And I was making pretty decent money in Toronto. 
And then when I moved to the U.S. in 2008, because I got married and my wife's American, came down from Canada, I said, you know what, let's, let's see if I can make like a full-time go at it. This is a good kind of lifetime transition. I'm leaving everything behind to, to literally kind of start a new life. And it felt really kind of good and freeing. And I still did some corporate work, but the push was always to put more time into the stories I wanted to tell. Uh, and I just, like I never told anybody no that wanted me to you know work on their project i never told myself no that this idea wasn't worth pursuing or this project wasn't worth taking a chance on or investing hours in um, that kind of investment will always yield dividends so whether you're working on a music video lugging sandbags around or whether you're spending three hours when you're dead tired at night just brainstorming ideas for a script or, or a scene that you want to work on it always will always come back and, and pay you dividends in spades so I, I directed a film, and it's available now on Vimeo. And my new site actually just launched last night, robmccallumfilms.com. And there's a link to it. I, I did somewhat of a B-movie called Unearthly. It's an action sci-fi adventure, very Indiana Jones uh, meets Jurassic Park. The script required like $400 million, but we shot it for a few thousand. Oh, Hence man. the B-movie fun that, that came with it and, and the ridiculous CG effects and the kind of wacky story that, that came together. Um, and the lesson I learned from that is it's really hard to do something big in the cinema that I like with the budget I have and the resources I have. So right after that premiered, like the week after, I said, what if I did something that was more contained and, and you know, easy to manage? And that's where Nintendo Quest came from. You know, I, I've always been doing documentaries, whether they were shorts or something that was, you know, 30 to 40 minutes long stuff on collecting stuff on fanboys. Um, I have a, it's on YouTube now if you want to check it out. I have a short doc called Jim Henson's Stick Strings and Felt. Um, one of my idols, a lot of people, like his approach to stuff and generally his philosophy to life. So I thought, you know what, let's go back to documentaries. Nintendo Quest came about. I think it worked out pretty well. Um, and from there, uh, a year later, I shot Missing Mom, which is another road trip movie with a really scaled down crew in which I hit the road to see if I can track down my mom who's been missing for 25 years. And that comes out next month. And then after that, I got hired to do a rock band documentary on a band from my hometown called Kitty. They're pretty big uh, worldwide. They've sold over 2 million records, really big in the early 2000s, the co-headlined OzFest. And again, that was another kind of you know, easy, small scale crew, but we could do so much with what the concept was and just really pushing the limits. So you've got to learn what those limits are. And by starting with writing, you really, you really get an idea of what you can do in, in a limited kind of capacity and how big you can take something with not a lot to do. Does that make sense? Oh yes, definitely. Because a lot of times people are not sure exactly how much they can do, and I think they get overwhelmed because they say, "Oh, I don't think I can extend myself. I don't think I can do all this, or I don't think I can bring all these people together." And sometimes with writing, you, it's just you, and then yeah. you have to expand out. So once you know what you can do, then you can you can go out and expand yourself. And a lot of times people are so scared nowadays. On social media, they can be they can reach out, but then in real life, you have to go out and you have to say, "Hey." I want to help other people. I, I want to be social. And sometimes that's hard for people nowadays. It's really hard. And I, I would say just experiment and take the pressure off yourself. You know, I already said you got to start with the audience and work back. And I fully believe that you got to know what your end goal is. If your end goal is just to take a weekend and shoot like a 10 minute movie or what you think is a 10 minute movie just for the sake of doing it, that's great. If you're trying to make a documentary that you want to have distribution around the world, well, that's great too, but they each have their own different sets of challenges. Not, one is not better than the other in the scope of what you're trying to accomplish. And you need to understand that. You see, like, I was really lucky in that I grew up in a non, or like the early days of YouTube and the early days of social media. Nowadays, I see a lot of people posting their videos online and it's like, you know, tell me what you think of my video. Is it good? Is it not good? And people just you know, they scream at them and they say it's crap and it's garbage and you should never touch a camera or do this or do that. And, you know, it shuts people down. No wonder people are scared and nervous to try things in a world where it's so critical and everyone thinks they have an opinion. I grew up in an era where I got to experiment kind of offline. 
So I would tell people experiment offline. Do your own thing for your own group of people and don't listen to people. Just keep pushing. You got to try. You got to experiment. The only way you're going to get better is if you do it. And sometimes that means stubborn confidence, knowing that you're doing the right thing for you and for your means, whether other people understand that at the time or not. Definitely. Now, as far as box art, um, I grew up and it, it, may be, it may be weird to some gamers. If you're like very young and you're playing games, you may see like some of the art where it's just a picture or a live action picture and you see that and you're like, oh, what's, is that box art? I grew up at a time where you would get like Yars Revenge. That's one of the things I remember seeing that in sure. Atari. And you would see this awesome art of this like huge, like alien looking creature, like robotics and all this. And then you'd play the game. And of course, to, to us, it still was cool. But if you look at that art and then you look at the game, it was completely different. But that art drew you in. Or I remember seeing Spider-Man for the Amiga. You would see like that animation, and even the title screen, how that looked. Can you just tell us about what you, you know, that kind of what you're trying to bring, the people behind that, you know, how that would draw the, the gamers into the game and, and what people may not understand about that kind of art and what the craftsmanship that went into creating that? Sure. Well, I've, I've no shortage of opinions on the subject, which I think is a good thing since I'm making a documentary on it, hopefully. Um, for me, box art, and especially in the eras that you're, you're talking about, I would say pretty much everything up until 1995, though maybe up until the year 2000, um, was usually better than the actual games themselves from an aesthetic point of view. Uh, I hate using words like this, like box art is terrible or this piece is not good or that piece is excellent because I think it's all really, really great and interesting. And what makes one thing great is usually because it's compared to something else. The role of box art is what is so important, though, that box art is an extension of the game. It's almost a promise of what that premise is. So you look at a cover like Yar's Revenge, you look at something like uh, Panic Restaurant for, for NES. This is a wacky, hyper-stylized version that can never be you know, replicated in the graphics at the time. But that puts you in the mindset to connect the dots to the graphics that you do see. You know, the graphics become almost like a placeholder for what you saw on, on the cover work so that you see the character. And sure, it's not a direct translation, but you can see enough similarities that it's like, hey, yeah, that does make sense. That That's this guy here. And because you've had the experience of seeing that cover art, it enhances your experience. And I think it's really interesting that nowadays most cover art and box art, what's left of it, and we'll see what's left by the time we're done doing the doc is... We get more and more to it, a digital only era. Most of it is like in-game screenshots from what I can tell. Now, this is the exciting part about the documentary. We get to explore what box art is nowadays, as well as rediscover what it was before. But box art that's, that's captured from an in-game engine almost looks lifeless. It looks like it's static. There is no energy. There is no movement. There is no life to a lot of the stuff that I see. And I think you're starting to see on an independent level, people go back to something that is more stylized, that is above and beyond what the game does promise for the sake of getting people excited. So you've got to look at what the, what the box does, what the game does, and how you interact with both of those. And it's a really, it's a lost art form. It really is. And the manual as well plays a role in that, which is another source of art. And these people never got any credit. Yeah. You know, when you write a script, when I write a script, we get to put our names on it. You know, we get to take the authorial credit that we did this. Those people never got to sign anything, so nobody knows who they are. You know, nobody, and these are the images that really define gaming for the first 30 years. You know, when you think of a game like Yara's Revenge, I guarantee you think of that cover first oh, and yeah. foremost. When you think of Mario 3, you think of that cover first and foremost. You know, when you think of Shenmue, you probably still think that cover first and foremost instead of a cutscene in the game or, or a stage in the game because that was your first experience and that experience defines it, right? A, a first impression is the lasting one, right? And the thing is, is that for a lot of gamers, you know, people got to realize, especially if you're younger, is that there wasn't really, there wasn't a demo, um, there wasn't a com really a commercial for it or you really didn't see it. There wasn't as many. Uh, There's no internet. Let's start yeah, with that. There was no internet. If there was a magazine, the magazine probably was also the cover art. 
Yeah. So that's all you had. So you would pick it up. You would look at it as how maybe someone who likes art would go into you know, a museum and look at a painting. You would pick up the box art, the box, and you would look at the art and you would study it. And maybe you look at the back and maybe there'd be one or two screenshots, but you'd quickly look at that and then you'd turn and look back at the box art and you'd look at it and that's what you'd be deciding if you'd get the game or not, even though you knew maybe what the graphics look like. That's how you'd decide if you'd get the game or not. It was a real gamble. It was a little bit like Russian roulette, right? Sometimes it worked out great, sometimes not so much, but the box art was such a deciding factor. And I, and I like that. I really do like that. Of course, we all got the games that we felt a little ripped off because the cover was so good and the game didn't deliver on that. Yeah. But I also think that maybe in our childlike wisdom, we never gave those games enough of a shot in some cases. It, it's, it's all really fascinating. And to give these people the, the light and to hear these stories, man, like we have the guy who did the Sonic the One, Sonic One box, Greg Ray on board. And I was talking to him on the phone. He's like, yeah, so I'm sitting there drawing Sonic and there's a Japanese gentleman next to me on a phone to Japan, relaying every single like you know pencil line that I'm doing, and then within 10 seconds I have to erase something and redo it because someone in Japan is saying it has to be different. Wow. You know, and this is like a high pressure situation, right? Like here he is trying to do this. Sega at the time was trying to be, you know, was trying to take market capital away from Nintendo, and that's just one of a thousand stories. We got the guy who helped co-create the Legend of Zelda font that first made its debut on Link to the Past. You know, the font that we still love today. We've got, you name it, we've got somebody from all eras. We got Brom who did Doom, right? Like, talk about yeah. great PC game. And we got guys that are behind LucasArts games. We've got, we've got a lot of people that deserve to say, this is how I got in the industry, which I think is super inspirational for any creative person out there. And this is what it was like this is why it's important, and here's how it's changed over the years. Yeah, and, and even besides just the actual picture, everything from the logo, everything that was created on the box, I mean, it, even in Marketing 101, it, it taught you the, the colors, the shapes, the font, everything would yeah. draw you in, and like you said, it's those iconic images as much as the character itself that made you decide to get that game or not, and then all the stories behind it, it, it really makes a very interesting. Now, I see that, you know, you're, you're halfway to your goal, but you want to go beyond that. And I really, much so. I really like it because, you know, I was looking over the stretch goals and I like what you're, you're trying to do that if you go uh, beyond your goal and you hit your stretch goals that you want to expand to give a little bit more. Because obviously, you know, within film, you have your, your, your number, you know, you want to hit that 90 minute mark. But, you know, a lot of people really like those stories. People like to go in depth. So can you talk a little bit about what happens if you go and you start to hit those stretch goals? Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite simple. Uh, you know, 90 minutes is kind of like what a distributor wants, which is the best and the worst, right? Because a distributor can take something and put it all over the world. It's what our goal was with Nintendo Quest. And because we hit that magic kind of sweet spot, it's easy for them to shop it in foreign markets where they have tighter time restrictions. And, you know, then we have like online or we're starting to see in other formats. So if we hit our $30,000 kind of base goal we we can do a 90 minute film more or less but if we hit 35 we want to do like mini featurettes so these would be like mini documentaries that go above and beyond the 90 minutes so you might see like a section on thematics put together that was left out of the film that couldn't make it because it would have pushed it over 90 minutes or you might see you know a bunch of fans talking about it and comparing and contrasting or reacting to stuff it gives us that breathing room that i so desperately want as a filmmaker to take those handcuffs off and say look we have more stuff. We really just need the time to kind of share it with you guys and the time to capture it. Uh, at at 40,000, we get uncut interviews and more extended segments. These are my favorite things on, on DVDs nowadays. When you can have like, you know, an uncut interview with someone that you idolize or someone that was kind of crucial to the process or that thing that you love, it's great. Like, I really wish on the Star Wars disc that came out for Force Awakens, there was an uncut J.J. Abrams interview. How great yeah. would that be able to see like happening in real time without any edits, just to hear him talk about it without, you know, the, the magic of editing. I, th I think it's a kind of special thing that's underutilized. Um, and the ultimate, the 50K mark, if we hit 50,000, and I think we can do it if we get enough support, we'll turn our 90 minute feature into an episodic like series. Like a Ken so, Burns baseball of a box art. 
well, there's so much to cover, right? Like we could break it down by decades, so 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and current, plus something else. I mean, I don't know how many episodes. It's really going to depend on, on the content. Even if it's four episodes that are like a half hour long, you know, it sure it sounds like okay, it's only a half hour extra, but it allows us the freedom of a format switch to do that kind of thing. So we're, we're still gonna make the 90 minute movie because we have a tier that allows you just to get that, like the $13 digital or the $25 DVD with your name in the credits too. But everybody that pledges $39 or higher will get all the stretch goal content. You know, so you could have basically this season one maybe, maybe there's gonna be a season two, I don't know, of box art for like 39 bucks. It's a, it's a really great deal and to get all this content, you know, we. Uh, as a guy who does a lot of Kickstarter uh, projects and a guy who backs a lot, I don't believe in gouging people. I don't want to put stuff up there that I wouldn't support. I really think $39 is fair for what could be, you know, four hours of content, six hours. Nintendo Quest, everybody that backed that got three discs packed full of stuff. So you have the 90 minute future plus four hours of additional material. We just want the time to be able to kind of do that and craft it and not just kind of throw footage out there. I think it's important that you allow professionals a little bit of time to make something professional for you if you're going to put your money down. Now, I'm always fascinated by the idea of when you talk to people who are in, game in, in, in the game industry, people who are gamers, you're creating kind of like a celebrity, not the negative connotation of it, but you know, people who maybe 20 years ago were thought of in a negative like oh you're a gamer that's bad you still have some of that but now with documentaries with film with esports you know being a gamer is something where you, you can make a profession out of it people want to talk to you in your experience doing these documentaries reaching out to these people uh to talk to them about their craft have you found that more of them are feeling you know like happy when you interview them that you're coming to them that they have people that want to talk to them to be in these documentaries to be interviewed to talk about their craft where maybe in the past people didn't really talk to them that much because it wasn't something that they were pursued for well for box art specifically the overwhelming uh gut reaction from everybody we talked to and like we have a hundred people listed i think on kickstarter and another hundred that we have yet to reach out to and I, every day the campaign goes on we seem to add more names to the list and every time the reaction is you want to talk to me? Why do you want to talk to me? You think I'm important? Oh, wow, geez, I haven't thought about that for 20 or 30 years. That, that's really great of you. Like, overwhelmingly, people undervalue their importance and their significance in the industry. So I think it, they've even divorced the idea that they were ever important. And I think a lot of that goes to because they were never asked to be important. They were asked to do a job and it was treated like a job and they were treated like a cog in the process and they were told to move on after which is really kind of a, a crummy thing to do to people. And I think if there is any kind of switch between the negative connotation of gamers and more of a positive one, I think it's really the human element that we're starting to see push more and more in this content. So when we see eSports stuff, when you see something like Nintendo Quest, and you'll certainly see it in Boxer, and you'll see it in Power of Grayskull too. It's not just what the topic du jour is, it's who is responsible for that? And anytime you talk about who, you have to get down to the human element. Who are these people? And once you understand that it's not about being a gamer, this is about a person who wants to do something and this is important to them, then all of a sudden it can only be positive because we can all relate to those human goals, those human emotions of anxiety and fear and excitement. And anybody that's not creating content on that, that's when I think you get a lot of the negative stuff. You know, if you start, really putting the human through line through stuff you'll you'll get it you'll get that kind of reaction and we're, we're seeing it now and it, it's it's really nice that we finally turn turn the tide i think where we're getting more and more human stories I, you can't underestimate the value of a human story we all need inspiration and documentary is a great format to showcase that because it feels closer to reality yeah, and I think that's why it's great that there are a lot of people out there and filmmakers like you who are making these different type of documentaries. That's why I hope that you know people will go and, and fund uh, this Kickstarter for Box Art and, and other Kickstarters that do you know great work like this because I think that these stories should be told and that more positive you know stories like this and more stories just for gamers that are positive should be you know showcased so i really thanks for coming on and talking to us about this and i hope that it's, this gets funded and beyond get those stretch goals done it's it's my pleasure man like 
there's so many stories. I'll give you a quick story because I know you got to wrap up. We got to get out of here. The one quick story. Two artists, good time friends. They had a falling out because one of them got a contract to work with another studio. Tried to get the other guy in. He couldn't do it because it, there was some bitter jealousy because uh, they weren't brought over together at the same time. No problem. They had been friends for 25, 30 years. Well, five years goes by. They, they reunite. They're having a few drinks at this guy's cabin. He has a lot of property. Well, the drinks turned into... Uh, a motivation to talk about what happened in the past, how one guy was picked over the other. And the guy who was picked over essentially said, look, I'm sorry, I wanted you to get in. I can probably still make a few phone calls. And it, and it turned really ugly to the point where the guy who was left out got a gun and oh, was man. threatening this other guy's life. And this other guy ran and hid in the woods from this guy. And he wouldn't leave him because he was afraid for the guy who had the gun's life and what he might do because of all this other stuff that was also happening in his life. He wouldn't give up on him because he believed in him that much, regardless of any of the, you know, substances that would happen that night with the alcohol and stuff, regardless of the, the you know, the drasticness of, of grabbing a gun and what was said. People don't give up on each other in, in the creative industry. And uh, the police were called and stuff like that. And the guy was asked, do you want to press charges? He's like, no, I don't. The guy's a really good guy. He's gone through a really tough time. And he doesn't know how to talk about it and he's frustrated wow. imagine your life being on the line what would you do if that person that was threatening you was your best friend and someone who was responsible for your own professional uh career it's just one of the stories that i've heard while researching this and uh you know it gives me chills to, to see what these people have experienced and endured and to hear a story like that and that someone would kind of risk their life for the sake of their art and, and to involve other artists to make sure everybody has a livelihood and then never be able to sign their name to a painting. It's kind of ridiculous. And see, and that's the kind of things that people want to hear because a lot of times you just see something and you're like, oh, that's cool. And then you pop in a game and you never think about it again. But, you know, a lot of people, especially as you get older, maybe when you're young, you don't think about it. But as you get older, especially with as big as retro collecting is, you want to learn about the games you grew up. So things like this is really important. Yeah, there's a lot of stories to be told. Let's let's find out why we have the games we love, why we think things are cool and, and who's responsible for them. So uh, my final pitch is go to Kickstarter.com. Check out Box Art Documentary. Uh, you can go to BoxArtDoc.com. We're on Facebook as well. Facebook.com slash BoxArtDoc. We're all over the place. Kickstarter is the easiest way to help us out and make this a reality. We're going to put the links up on uh, as well on the website and on the YouTube so that you guys can go. So, as I said, go get this funded, get those stretch goals done. Rob, thanks for coming on and talking with us today. No problem. Anytime.